Hi, it's Matt Thomas from King and Eek, back on the Sonic with my... Look at this t-shirt! Yeah! Ah, I'm not sponsored or anything, I just love my t-shirt and lost the hair as well. It's all got chopped, the big straggles. But you don't care about this, you care about virtual vocalists and that's why you clicked a video. Not dickhead with red t-shirt admires hair. Virtual vocalists, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of plugins out and about now and they sing, they make your computer sing. If you can't sing yourself, like me, then it's quite nice if you can get a computer to sing. Now, for the last few years, that's been a bit of a niche thing. I mean, when I say niche, I mean huge in Japan and a bit niche elsewhere. But I think we're gonna talk about this because I reckon five to 10 years from now, you're gonna say, I remember watching that video with Matt where he said, I'll be using a virtual vocalist. And I thought, mm, well, maybe. I reckon you're gonna, because I've looked into what's out there and there's all kinds of exciting new things happening, particularly with some AI stuff going on. And there is so much interesting stuff in music coming in AI, but not much of it has really reached a sort of plug-in studio level yet. So we're gonna get a little peek into where things are heading. Intrigued? Me too. But before we can see where things are heading, we're gonna find out how we went from this <laughs> to this <laughs> I have this. This. And this. Now, the earliest confirmed inventor of a speaking machine was a man called Christian Gottlieb Kratzenstein. In 1780, he invented something he called a vowel organ. Now, what he'd worked out was in order to make each one of the R, E, O sounds, we sort of constrict our throat and move our mouth to make resonant spaces. And he worked out that if he made organ pipes that copied those same resonances, then when you pressed a key, you could have an R, E, A organ. And he made this and it worked. But to make actual singing or speaking, we're gonna need some consonants. Hungarian scientist Wolfgang von Kempelen had spent several decades from the 1760s working on a series of speaking machines. Now, these were manipulated by his highly trained hands to create vaguely human sounds. When I tell you that the machine was cobbled together from a bagpipes, bellows, a clarinet, had a rubber mouth and a wooden tongue, you may have a faintly eerie image in mind. Fortunately for us, when academics rebuilt his machine, it was all discreetly housed in a wooden box, so we're shielded from the full horror of what's going on inside there. Now, vaguely unsettling as all that was, it is as nothing compared to what followed. So after von Kempelen died in the early 1800s, his work was picked up by a number of different inventors. And one of them was a man named Joseph Farber and his euphonia. Now, the euphonia was a sort of cross between a piano and the aftermath of a beheading. The operator controlled the mechanism from a piano keyboard to which was attached a sort of doll's head meets death mask, which spoke in a slow, rasping tone. Contemporary accounts suggest that the effect was equal parts impressive and disturbing. Convinced that the entertainment world was just crying out for a possessed talking piano, Farber took the euphonia on the road as a sideshow attraction. There he discovered that his years of mastering the technique of making the euphonia sing and talk didn't result in the stunned applause he'd hoped for, but rather the sound of appalled crowds fleeing from a horrifying muttering ghoul. Sadly, there are no recordings of any of these early mechanical singing machines. But in recent years, researchers at Kagawa University have made their own mechanical mouth, which... Now, fortunately, the arrival of electricity put an end to all this mechanical horror. And by the early 1900s, electronics meant that a man named Homer Dudley and his collaborator, Robert Wrights, 
were able to start working on a thing we all now know as the vocoder. Now, a happy sort of side effect of the vocoder was a machine they called the Voder. Rather like the Euphonia, the Voder needed a skilled operator. It used 10 keys, rather all your fingers and your thumb, and foot pedals and a wrist bar. And by spending 18 months learning to do this, you could use those controls to make it talk. She saw me. Now say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? She saw me. The most skilled was a woman named Helen Harper. and She operated the voter at the 1939 World Fair in New York, where it sang Old Lang Syne. The voter was in effect half of a vocoder, just one where the sound was generated with keys and pedals rather than by analysing a voice. Now, if you have 18 months to spare and want to try honing your voder skills, you can head to this rather fantastic website. It's griffin.moe forward slash voder. And here, a very simplified version of the voder has been coded up. So using your own computer keyboard, you get the voder's 10 keys and the space bar doesn't quite do the same thing as the real voder. It doesn't give us a swap between white noise and oscillator tone. It simply triggers a white noise. That slightly reduces how accurate we can make this and the fact that the keys are just on off, whereas the Voda had a continuous volume control of each one of the sound sources. It means we're kind of working with a very simplified thing. However, it means you can get quite a simple robot result quite fast. So A and K together are the E in heed, A and D are the OO in pool, etc. So I'll come down here and you can see these are light up as I'm playing on my QWERTY keyboard here. So we'll get that E sound from heed. And now we'll try the OO sound from pool. So you can see straight away we can get these basic sounds. Each one of these keys is a narrow bandpass filter. And the space bar is the noise source. So I'll try doing she saw me as we saw in the video. So we've got here sh, space, and then E is A and K. So there you go, she saw me. Try that again. There you go, Vodering. The Haskins Laboratories pattern playback machine followed in 1950 and replaced the laborious and complicated keyboard controls of the Voda with sonograms or pictures of sound that could be drawn in shapes that created electronic voices. Never kill a snake, never kill a snake. You can hear how the sounds change as the picture changes. The 1960s saw the birth of the digital voice synthesizer. In one type of experiment, the computer is programmed to act as a numerical model of the human vocal tract, producing synthetic speech. Speech synthesis researchers John Kelly and Carol Lochbaum created a physical modeling algorithm that simulated the human vocal tract. And in collaboration with computer music pioneer Max Matthews, they made a computer sing for the first time. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to the computer, an IBM 704 mainframe singing Daisy Daisy, was demonstrated to sci-fi writer Arthur C. Clarke on a visit to Bell Labs, and he then incorporated it into his screenplay for 2001. Ever more sophisticated voice synthesis software appeared in ever more affordable products, things like toys, watches, calculators, and of course, home computers. From Texas Instruments, Speak and Spells, to the software Automatic Mouth on the Commodore 64, the sound of speaking computers began to fill homes across the world. And of course, we've all got speech synthesizers now. Siri, Cortana and Alexa listening to our every word. Despite speaking electronic voices becoming quite popular in the consumer world, singing electronic voices weren't really catching on. Hardware synthesizers offered very little in this way. I mean, you could say that the Mellotron Choir was an early singing voice, kind of. The Roland VP330, a sort of combination of analog choir and a vocoder. Again, it's kind of trying to get you doing something electronic, but again, it's not really singing. You're putting the, uh, the effort in with the vocoder. So it was only really the arrival of sampling that tempted musicians to start really messing with voices. All of a sudden, people like Art of Noise, <laughs> 
Yellow. Jean-Michel Jean with Twisting Human Sound. But it really wasn't vocal synthesis, it was still recordings of voices. It took the arrival of VSTs for proper vocal synthesis to start breaking into the mainstream. Initially these were quite gimmicky things, the infamous Dalai Lama and the less well-known vocalese. Now if you like the look of these guys, I did a course on Wednesday which is on the Sonic YouTube for free in which we had a proper fiddle with these. So if you want to find out more about those guys, go and have a look. But they were just the, the sort of bridgehead. Behind it came the invasion force, and that was Yamaha's Vocaloid. A guy named Hideki Kenmochi had been doing research into concertinative synthesis. Yes! That is literally about the ninth tape. Hideki Kenmochi concertinative synthesis. I can say it now. Right. So, a guy called Ki <laughs> I've been doing research into a thing called concertinative synthesis, a cross between sort of granular synthesis and sampling. And it was this that Yamaha licensed to form the basis of their Vocaloid singing engine. After four years, Yamaha's Project Daisy, named after the Bell Lab's singing IBM computer, finally came to the market as Vocaloid in 2004. As well as the core software, each release has added more voices to the library, and third-party developers have also released voices for the system. Each voice is associated with an avatar, an animated character, and fans discuss interactions between the characters, rate them for their popularity, and imagine dream team singing bands. It's rather like a reality TV show. So while you can buy the voices of these iconic characters, and you can make and release music using them, you can't use the character's name or any of the associated imagery. So it's kind of like a sort of fan fiction. The official producers and owners of the Vocaloid characters protect them pretty fiercely, and with good reason. The most famous characters play stadiums in front of thousands of glow stick wielding fans, all uniformly waving the appropriate coloured glow stick for that particular singer. In the case of Vocaloid superstar Hatsune Miku, she has even teamed up with Lady Gaga. The weirdest thing about immersing myself even briefly in the world of Vocaloid is how sensible all this stuff starts to sound, even though in a way it's nothing more than a synthesizer preset. It's like as if Spitfire Audio released a cello library called Edward that likes to wear tweed jackets and spend his free time in the British Library reading room. Then again, there are sample libraries of famous instrumentalists like the Joshua Bell Violin Library. When you look at it that way, it doesn't sound so odd again. The situation is probably best summed up by Miriam Stockley, one of the few famous singers behind a Vocaloid voice. She said, you can't stop progress, no matter how strange it sounds. And I guess that's where we are. Now, if you want to get your own hands on some of these virtual vocalists, you have a number of options these days. Everything from hardware synthesizers right through to Korg's very own Miku guitar pedal, which will turn your guitar into the sound of a Japanese animated singer. On the plug-in front, there are a whole bunch to look at. As well as Yamaha's Vocaloid, there is the popular freeware Utau, Plogue's Alter Ego and Chip Speech. Then there's Aqua's Tone and Deep Vocal. And there are things such as Veersin's Cantor, Synthesizer V. There is a long list. So, let's have a mess with some of them. Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate the support from you guys. If you liked this video, then you know, smash that like button. And if you want to be notified about new content, hit the subscribe and the bell notifications. Peace!